Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa New Zealand, episode 11, a map, a whare and a marae. Last time, we talked about Māori social organisation, both at the macro level, the whānau, hapu and iwi, and micro level, rangatera, tutua and taurekareka. Don't remember what those words mean? Well, I am building a section on the website with all of the Māori words and terms we have covered so far. This in particular is meant to help those outside Aotearoa that may have difficulty with the te that I use in Hans and need a visual reference to work with. It would be great to hear if that's something you think might be valuable and if you get anything from it when it does eventually go live. Anyway, that was the social framework that Māori were working in and in this episode we will talk a bit more about the actual physical structures that this social framework was based around, starting with the land itself and how Māori viewed their own borders. To do that, I'm going to tell you a story. When Cook returned from his first voyage to Aotearoa and a variety of other places in 1771, one of the ideas he brought back was how Māori made use of flax. He didn't bring back all the knowledge that was needed though, and the bigwigs back in London decided they would like to use New Zealand flax in their newly established colonies in Australia, or more specifically, Norfolk Island which was under Australian jurisdiction. So they needed to figure out a way to get the missing pieces. The main fella behind this was the Lieutenant Governor of Norfolk Island, Philip Gidley King. Writing in January 1791, quote, Every method has been tried to work it, but I much fear that until a native of New Zealand can be carried to Norfolk Island, that the method of dressing that valuable commodity will not be known. And could that be obtained, I have no doubt but Norfolk Island would very soon clothe the inhabitants of New South Wales." So they were clearly trying to do it themselves, but not having much luck, with the idea being to use the process flax to make clothes, something Māori had already been using the flax for, amongst other things. The problem was that this was a fairly involved process, and so it wasn't really something they could just trial and error to figure out. As King mentioned in that quote, The plan would be to grab a couple of quote-unquote New Zealanders and take them to Norfolk Island to teach the convicts there how to process flax to make clothes. King was insistent on this plan until July of 1791, when the Home Secretary, Henry Dundas, instructed the Admiralty to use the ship Daedalus, which was currently on its way to Vancouver, Canada, to take quote, a flax dresser or two, end quote, from New Zealand to Sydney, Australia. It did take some time for the Daedalus to reach the South Pacific though, and during that time, Lieutenant Governor King decided to approach the captain of a whaling ship, offering them some money to do the job. The captain accepted, and sailed to somewhere near modern Kaitaia, at the very top of the North Island, to try and convince some local Māori to join him, which he failed to do. For some weird reason, the idea was never discussed or implemented to force them onto the ship. Maybe because whalers weren't soldiers? Who knows. In any case, the Daedalus arrived in 1793 and set about trying to find someone to take to Australia. The big blunder, though, comes here, whereby the captain didn't really take too much notice of who he was grabbing, he just imprisoned the first two people he came across, which just so happened to be two young men who were invited aboard with the promise of gifts. They were given something to eat and drink, while unbeknownst to them, the Daedalus sailed off, not realising until it was too late. The people the Daedalus grabbed were two men named Tuki and Huru. They said the reason they were in the waka was that Tuki was visiting Huru and they saw the Daedalus on the horizon one day while hanging outside Huru's house. The ship was still there the following morning, so they decided to paddle out and see if they could trade for some iron, as well as just generally being a bit curious. Due to the deception, naturally they weren't really that into giving up any information. However, after dining with King and the captain a few times, the two Māori became more sociable and cooperated with them. There was just one problem. Flax preparation and weaving was a woman's job, not something a priest and warrior, who were both chiefs, would really know anything about. (laughs) Huh, whoops. They did have a good crack at teaching the convicts on Norfolk Island though, as they did know some from hanging around with their wives, but not really enough for it to be of any use. Despite this, 
one of the most amazing pieces of information that King managed to get from Tuki, the priest, was a map drawn by Tuki himself. I'll put an image up on the website of Tuki's map as it is one of the first instances of a written Māori map and gives us a great insight into how Māori viewed themselves and those around them. For starters, it should be noted that the annotations you see were made by King's secretary and would explain why many of those words you see are spelt phonetically and don't really resemble written te reo Māori today. The most obvious part of the map is that there are two major islands, Te Ika a Maui, the Fish of Maui, or the North Island, and Te Waipunamu, the Place of Greenstone, or the South Island. Obviously, the islands aren't drawn to any sort of scale and are a cartographer's nightmare, with the South Island being fairly small, when in reality it is actually larger than the North Island. The latter also mostly consists of Northland, the area north of modern Auckland. So it's not terribly useful as an actual map, but it does tell us a lot about what Tuki knew about his neighbours and the fact that he was at least aware of the South Island as a source of greenstone, even if he wasn't massively familiar with it. Looking into the details more, we can see Tuki has split his local area into eight districts, noting where the principal chief in each one lived, as well as how many warriors they commanded. Tuki even notes chiefs higher than him, possibly the rangatira and ariki of his area with larger houses than his own, which is located in Hododo, as it is shown, or Oruru Valley, as it would have been called. The political landscape is also noted, with Tuki and his people allied with those in Hokianga and the Bay of Islands against another group made of Whangaroa, Murifenua and some others that I failed to translate. This presents an interesting challenge, as it would mean that for Tuki to visit Huru, he would have to go past hostile territory in his waka, which makes you wonder how often he would do this, and whether rival tribes would stop him if they found him. Another interesting detail on this map is that it seems to keep to the common Polynesian metaphor of islands being fish. The North Island is called Te Ika a Maui, because it was the fish that was caught and brought up by Maui himself, and the naming of places reflects this. The muri in muri whenua referred to the rear part of the fish in the north, whereas places that have mua in their name refer to the head of the fish and tend to be closer to the southern part of the North Island. You can also see a pair of dotted lines running up what you might say is the spine of the fish, and each territory has some access to this spine. This is Te Aratapu, the sacred track that souls walk to reach Cape Reinga, which is where they depart for mythical Hawaii. Tuki's map tells us a lot, but one of the most important things it tells us is that Hapu and Iwi had very defined territories. There was no doubt in who owned what and where the borders were, which other Europeans around Aotearoa noted as well. It was well known between Māori that there should be no encroachment on Hapu or Iwi territory by another chief unless given permission. In the event that this occurred, the challenge was taken with the utmost seriousness. Sir William Martin, the first Chief Justice of New Zealand, wrote in the 19th century, quote, Every tribe sees, in any successful encroachment upon its territory, a peril to its own independence, and even to its existence as a distinct tribe, end quote. So that is to say that to make a push into a hapu's territory represented a challenge and a threat to the very existence of the hapu. One of the aspects of these very clearly defined hapu boundaries that caused much confusion with Europeans was that despite no land was left unclaimed, much of a hapu or iwi's territory were usually unsettled and the resources within not utilised. To Māori, this was normal. You knew where the boundaries were and who owned what, and that was that. It didn't matter that your neighbour wasn't mining those rocks or fishing in that river, that was theirs, unless you wanted to go to war. Europeans, coming from a place where every section of arable land was productive and every resource utilised, saw all this land that no one was sitting on or doing anything with and thought it was up for grabs. Basically, the thinking was, how could you claim it was yours if you weren't living on it or using it in some way? This system of not using all the land available to them led a lot of Europeans to think the borders between tribes was ill-defined or perhaps didn't even exist at all. Such as in the case of Edward Wakefield of the New Zealand Company, who said Māori, quote, 
knew not of any further right to a district covered in primeval forest far too vast for the use of any descendants of their tribe, end quote. In saying that, not every European held that belief, which we should remember in general going forward. For example, Lieutenant Governor Robert Fitzroy, second governor of New Zealand, stated before the Select Committee of the House of Lords in 1838 that, quote, I had heard it asserted that there is a great deal of waste land which anybody may make use of. But from where I saw myself, I should say that every acre of land is owned, and that there is much tenacity with respect to a particular boundary, end quote. As a quick side note, don't worry too much about who all these people are. We'll talk about them as we get to them in the narrative. Well, I, I say narrative, it hasn't been terribly narrative so far, but it will be once Europeans arrive. Anyway, all this land that various hapu claimed wasn't all held in the same regard. That is to say, some was valued more than others. Edward Shortland, if you remember who he is, broke it up into four main classes. Going from most highly valued to least, the first class was land that was held by individuals or small groups through inheritance, takatapuna, received as gifts, takatuku, or conquered and occupied, takiraupatu. The second class was land open to common use of all the hapu, although some may be detached for personal use. The third was land claimed by neighbours but not currently occupied by either, and the final class was conquered land where some of the original inhabitants were allowed to remain. It was a fairly intuitive system, assuming it was vaguely accurate. Land that your family had always been on, or that had been received as, say, a marriage gift, or now had people on it after you fought for it, would naturally be valued higher than land that was seen as common use, or had people living on it that wasn't of the same hapu. Claims and rights over land, fisheries, fouling areas, and all sorts of other things were constantly debated, usually coming down to arguments of whakapapa. Shortland describes this process, in a little jest, potentially showing he didn't hold much faith in the idea. Quote, The counsel of the plaintiff, usually a chief with an interest in the matter, opens his case by naming in a loud voice some ancestor of his party, whom he calls the root of the land. He then endeavours to prove this root exercised some right of ownership undisputed by anyone, and deduces, step by step, the descent of his clients from this ancestor or root. If the adverse party cannot disprove the fact of original ownership or find flaw in the pedigree, the case would be decided against them. End quote. In Māori culture, land and resources were owned exclusively at the level they were claimed. By that I mean, when a claim was decided between whānau for, say, the use of a garden, it would never be ruled that the garden be shared or sections of the garden be shared. Either one whānau gained right to the whole garden, or the garden was split in half, and each whānau given exclusive access to that section. Before we move on to what Māori built on the land we have been talking about, let's come back to Tuki and Huru, and how their story ended. It's unclear whether Tuki drew the map as a means to show King how to get him home, or just as a piece of information about the neighbouring hapu. Either way, King gave Tuki a bunch of gifts such as cabbages, hand axes, carpenter tools, razors, scissors, hoes, spades, and seeds, including wheat, maize, and peas, along with two sows and two boars, which Tuki was to keep for breeding. The intention of King was to give Tuki gifts and tools to make the most of those gifts for items that might see an explosion of demand in Aotearoa and create some commercial opportunities. After this, Tuki and Huru were returned home where they fade from our story. Now that we have talked about the land Māori were on, let's talk about the things they put on the land. Whare, houses in pre-European and into the colonial periods, were rather simple in terms of their design, unless you were a chief, but even then, some still had rather unassuming dwellings. They tended to be A-frames with a single open space, rather than multiple rooms, with an open door and a window at the front for ventilation, and a small porch where the whānau could sit. Whare, like most things in this era, were made of whatever Māori had available locally, such as mānuka, niko, which are species of trees, fibres from prepared flax called muka, 
earth sods, or punga, known today as the silver fern. Typically though, they would have wooden frames with ropor, cat's tail reeds, or similar for walls, which would be tightly packed and held together with horizontal ties. The South Island is where the earthen sod tended to be favoured, as it was more insulating for the much colder climates. The roof usually had something similar using tussock, niko, ropo, or bark. It was these sorts of buildings that the whānau would live and sleep in, a whare mahana, warm house. The design and materials of these buildings would remain largely the same up until the 20th century, although some European materials like corrugated iron and sawn timber became popular as well as European styles of architecture. I'll put some pictures up on the website that were taken in the 19th and 20th centuries of all these sorts of whare so you can kind of see what I'm talking about, and I highly recommend you do so. They are really fascinating and most feature people in them, giving you a glimpse into their life. Alternatively, if you live in Wellington, the National Museum Te Papa has one set up as a permanent exhibit if you want to see one up close and personal. You don't keep your food and your valuables in your house though. Well, you do today, but back then when you didn't have a door or a lock or anything like that, you didn't. You put it in some sort of storage, and by around the time of European contact, Māori were using the pātaka. These were small buildings that were on wooden posts, sometimes only one, that were smooth to stop rats climbing up into them and usually sat just over two metres off the ground. These posts usually had some sort of large steps or a ladder system to allow access from under the pātaka, rather than from the front as the architectural design may imply. Some pātaka could be very large and ornately carved and decorated, which would bring a lot of mana and prestige to a hapu. Again, I'll put a picture up on the website of a pātaka so you can see what it looks like, but if you want to see one up close and inside, Te Papa is the place to go if you're in Wellington. If you're standing in front of the Te Papa Whare as you listen to this, the pātaka is behind you, to the right of the large ornate building that is likely garnering much more attention than most of the other stuff you can see. That gives a nice segue into our next building, because that building is a marae, a meeting house. Marae were a central part of Māori life, as they were the place for gatherings such as feasts, legal proceedings, tangihanga, funerals, and all sorts of other events. They were houses of diplomacy, law, and oration. But, the word marae doesn't exactly refer to that exact building. Marae have been labelled as anything from open areas to clusters of houses, and apparently, early explorers of New Zealand didn't mention marae perhaps because they are often not much different to other buildings that they saw. The building that most people today would call the marae is the Whare Nui, Great House. It is the largest and most important part of the marae area, as it is where most of the action happens. The other buildings are usually used for cooking, as bringing food into a marae is a big no-no. The reason for that is because food is noa, which is the opposite of tapu and marae are very, very tapu. The relationship between tapu and noa is extremely complex, and really something that needs to be explained by someone with a much deeper understanding than me. But one reason that marae may have been so tapu is due to the carvings, as suggested by Adrian John Tepiki Kotuku Bennett's thesis for the University of Canterbury. Marae typically had carvings representing ancestors and their feats, Some marae were a bit more minimalistic with their carvings, only having basic ones on the doorway, and others would be lavish with carvings, inside and out, and are called whare whakairo, carved houses. As you should be well aware by now, whakapapa was of the utmost importance to Māori, and so it should come as no surprise that representations of their ancestors were heavy with tapu. In fact, marae were often named after important ancestors, and were considered a physical representation of that ancestor, or even the marae as an ancestor in its own right. This meant carving was mahitane, men's work, as women were noa and not allowed to be involved. Although it is possible, women weaved the tukutuku patterns, which are the ones you see on the walls inside a marae. This intense tapu on carvings meant you couldn't mess around, you had to do it properly, 
And to illustrate my point, here is another quick story about a marae called Rauru. Tawaru was a great carver, a tonga of his art, and had begun making carvings for a whare nui in the 1850s, called Rauru, in honour of his wife. As we have talked about, this was a very tapu job, and you weren't allowed to bring food near the marae as food was noa. Tobacco was included in this restriction as well, which led to misfortune when he entered the unfinished marae smoking a pipe. Tawaru was advised by another that he should cease construction. Breaking tapu and ignoring it will surely piss off the gods and ancestors. Tawaru ignored the warnings though and continued until shortly after his wife died, forcing him to put his tools down. Sometime later, he married again and restarted his work with renewed vigour, hoping the tapu had diminished. It had not, and came down upon him again in the form of the death of his second wife. After even longer, Tawaru married for a third time, a marriage that bore him sons. This spurred him on to finish the house in his old age. His hard work and dedication paid off. After many years, he finished the amazing whare nui with intricate carvings, and it gave him and his family much mana. What? What do you mean? It can't happen for a third time. He's already lost two wives, the poor bugger. Apologies. Apparently his third wife and both his sons died as a result of his attempt. So, the whare nui remained unfinished, until a bloke called Charles Nelson of Rotorua came along and convinced Tawaru to part with the carvings, which I can only hope was not too difficult and that Tawaru had learned his lesson. Nelson employed three carvers to work on the marae, and this time it was actually completed, and erected in the village Whakariwariwa near Rotorua. When it was opened in 1900, Nelson had two priests perform a variety of ceremonies to remove the tapu. Unfortunately, within about a week, both of them died, and the building was shunned by the local community, only really there as a tourist attraction for people who had heard the story. The carvings were sold in 1904, and Rauru now sits in the Museum für Volkerkund, or the Museum for Ethnology in Hamburg, Germany. So if any of you live there, or are up that way for a holiday, pop in, have a look, and let us know what it's like. Just remember to be respectful, and take your shoes off before entering. Alternatively, if you live in Wellington, Again, you can go see the marae they have at Tapapa. You can guess where I went a few weeks ago, can't you? If you get the chance to be on a marae, in a museum or otherwise, I would highly recommend it. Just standing inside the Tapapa marae, despite the fact that museum marae are what Bennett calls quote-unquote sleeping houses, on account of them being conserved and not actively used, you can still feel the presence of the ancestors. I'd compare it to walking into a church, regardless of whether you are religious or not, I think most people would agree that when you walk into a church, it feels holy. It feels like something is there. In a whare whakairo, which the te marae very much is, you get the same sense with the carvings. But to bring it all back to my original point, tapu was extremely important and these buildings were just dripping in it, with the consequences of breaking and ignoring tapu being dire. So, what was actually involved in building a whare nui? Well, put on your PPE, we're going to run through how to build a marae. I have put up a diagram on the website that you can follow along with. Pre-European marae were built on four posts called po, that were thrust into the ground as the foundation, with larger supports called po tahuhu and po tuarongo set up at the front and back of the marae. Between these larger posts, a long ridge board, a tahuhu, was added which would form the centre of the roof. At each end, two logs that were joined to form a peak were attached to the large centre support near where the tahuhu was connected and supported by the two other smaller posts in each corner. These logs overhanged at their lowest point to form eaves, with the two logs at the front called maihi, which were often decorated with carvings. Foundations for the walls would be added next, with matua posts added on each side to aid in bearing the load of the structure. With the bases of the structure completed, thatching and reeds were added to fill in the gaps and any other internal carvings were added. 
The earth of the floor was then compressed, with woven mats being laid on top to add insulation. The important thing to remember with all this is that it was all being done without nails or pegs. Any joins were bound together with fibre rope or by using notches in the wood. At the end of construction, rituals were conducted to remove any tapu to make the whare nui safe for use. It is also possible that human sacrifice was part of this ritual, although I haven't found much to back that up. So, assuming you followed those instructions, you should now have a functional great house. But what should you do with it? Find out next time, where we talk about what to do in a marae, such as hui and pofuri. We'll also talk about cannibalism, sex, and focus a bit more on Māori women and their roles in traditional Māori society. That sounds a lot more exciting than the end of the last episode, doesn't it? If you want to send me feedback, ask a question, suggest a topic, or just have a chinwag, you can reach me through email at historyaotearoa at gmail.com or Twitter at History Aotearoa, or Facebook at History of Aotearoa New Zealand Podcast. Aotearoa is spelled A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes to help us grow and teach more people about the history of our island nation. As always, hari tu atu, hoki tu mai. See you next time. <laughs>